All right, coach, you're good to go. We'll start with your opening statements about this year's recruiting class. It was great. Enough said. We got a great group of guys on offense and defense. Um, we have players from Colorado and across the country, a bunch of guys that love football, that are believing in, in what we're trying to do at UNC, which is build a championship football program. As you guys know, our president, Andy Feinstein, and our athletic director, Darren Dunn, uh, committed to um, developing a winning culture and investing in our football program. And I believe that's what we've done. I think the players that we have recruited into our program understand that. And the players that were here, especially some of our uh, veteran leaders on this team, have embraced um, that culture. And so we're extremely excited. You know, talented players make coaches look a whole lot better. And so I think we brought in a lot of talent. But more importantly, I think we brought the right guys into the room, uh, the right guys onto the team, and, and players that just love football and want to be a part of something special. And that's what I think we have here. We have something special. We have a chance uh, to be great. And, um, and, but it does take the right people. I'm a big believer in finding the right people. It starts with the coaches and the players. And then putting you know, the right people in the right places. That's our job as coaches to put these players in a position to have success and to develop them, especially the players come in here out of high school, putting them in a college weight program and getting them ready to go, helping them to be the best that they can be. But, but I also believe the, the best teams are player, player led. And thank goodness um, we have some great leaders on this team that have taken some of our younger players under their wing already and that will hopefully be mentors to the, the young men coming into our program next season. All right, we'll start with Rob Mackey and Nine News. Ed, good to see you. Although it's really a boring background you got there. <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm still still learning this virtual thing. I'm an old dog, hard <laughs> to teach me new tricks. But hey, uh, uh, I want to want to ask you about uh, one of your transfers, uh, quarterback. I believe the first name is uh, I think it's pronounced Dylan. Um, can hmm. you tell us a little bit about him? Not familiar. We have a lot of kids in our program. What's the last name? I, McCaffrey, it looks like. Something like well, that. That's got to be. I I mean, is it E-R-Y or R-E-Y? Yeah. No, Rod, you know, I'm excited. We've known each other forever. We, we have kids and, you know, there's the father-son relationship and then there's the uh, coach-player relationship. And, you know, I'm extremely excited Dylan uh, decided to join our team. Uh, so extremely excited. A little more pressure on me with Lisa. You know that if things don't go right, Lisa's going to be upset. But um, but he had a lot of opportunities and a lot of choices, a lot of places he could have played. He wanted to come home, wanted to live in Colorado, wanted to play at UNC. And, and as a coach, obviously, I'm extremely thrilled because he makes us, I think, a whole lot better. But also as a father, it's really a cool experience being able to coach your son. And, um, you know, you have to be objective. I have to know when to put the dad hat on and when to put the coach's hat on. And uh, we, we divide those two roles for me. But I've coached my kids, um, you know, all of my kids at some point throughout their lives. So I feel really good about that relationship and that dynamic. But yeah, you know, 6'5", 220 pound quarterback who's played uh, some pretty big games and against some pretty big opponents um, in the FBS and the Big Ten. I think he gives, a, gives us a wealth of experience and a ton of talent. Um, we also have some weapons uh, for him that were on the team and that we brought in. And so I think that's one of the reasons he decided to choose us over some other schools was um, he saw some players that we've brought in from, uh, from Michigan, a friend of his, True Wilson, but also guys from Duke and Cincinnati and Indiana slash Akron and Washington State and uh, UCF and just you name it. We brought in a significant number of players with FBS experience to add to our roster and also guys that love football that are in it for all the right reasons. And so Dylan, like all those guys, um, they want to get on the field. They want to play. They want to be around guys that take football seriously and they, they want to have some success and they all believe that that's going to happen here. And, and so do I. So Dylan is, uh, you know, very excited that he chose to, to come play here at UNC. Pat Graham, Associated Press. Hey coach. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Um, I guess when you're coaching your son, do you almost have to have boundaries? I mean, is there a time when you got to just cut things off, say, okay, we're not, we're a family now. There's no more football. Yes. That's so hard to do, but yes, <laughs> you do. And I learned that in an early age, my, my son, Max, who's coaching receivers with us, um, learned he, he had to get the worst of it because he was our oldest son. And, you know, I first started coaching after I retired from the NFL and, and walked away from the Broncos. I went to coach my 
son, uh, Max, with his team. And I didn't really have that boundary established at the time of when I'm a father and when I'm a coach. So practice turned into a discussion on the way home in the car, turned into a discussion at the dinner table. And you absolutely have to know when, I think, and any dad who's ever coached his son will tell you, you have to know when to take your coach's hat off and uh, be a dad. I'm always gonna be a dad first. When we're on the football field, when we're in the weight room, when we're getting ready to play a game, I'm a coach. And uh, Dylan is one of many players that I coach and everybody is treated the same and it's a meritocracy and you have to have thick skin and have constructive criticism, but you can't live that 24 hours a day. There needs to be a break and there needs to be a boundary. And so luckily I made all my mistakes with Max and then learned with Christian and with Dylan and with Luke, um, you know, so we've, we've grown used to that dynamic and I feel very comfortable um, about coaching Luke. You also have to have great, great assistant coaches when you're a dad that coaches his son and you have to be able to coach through your other coaches. And so that's why I think it's so incredible that we have a great coaching staff with Coach Baldwin and some of our other assistant coaches who will help coach Dylan. And if I need to coach him, I can coach through them as well without you know, embarrassing him or, or calling him out in front of the team. I try to do that with all of our players as well. That's something I've learned over the many years of coaching is not to step on the toes of our position coaches and to let them do their job and to not usurp their authority or, or expertise. And uh, typically I'll do most of my coaching with um, our coaches and then they will coach our positions. Hi, Romy, CBS. Hey, Ed, so great to see you. Um, this is a little bit of a two-parter. You talked about this class coming in. You got a lot of leaders. Obviously, the quarterback is kind of the top leader of the team. So can you describe, one, what Dylan's leadership style is? And two, do you think he'll have more pressure being the coach's son? You know, Dylan, Dylan is, I mean, physically gifted. He's 6'5", 220. He can, he's really fast and he can throw the ball. So he, I mean, physically, he fits all the criteria we're looking for. In terms of a leader, he loves football. And he's one of four brothers. They all play football. They all love football. They're more competitive with each other in a loving way, of course, uh, than they are with anybody else. And so he's, he's played since he was six. He's been a quarterback since he was six. Um, he's been on teams that have won championships and both, you know, 10 years in a row in Little League and high school uh, state championships. Um, he's played in the same state as a dad who played for a professional team in our, in our area, right, with the Broncos. So he's endured all kinds of pressures. Uh, he plays with, uh, you know, his brother who's in the NFL. And so he, he, there's nothing that phases him. Uh, and the only pressure really is the pressure you put on yourself anyway. He knows that. And, uh, you know, you got to have pretty thick skin and you have to be very competitive and you have to be unfazed to be a quarterback in a family with uh, NFL players and brothers who all play um, when the spotlight is on you um, since you're a little kid. So he's been through all of that. He's completely unfazed. He loves football. He loves his teammates. Um, and uh, I think he has a lot of energy and enthusiasm when he's on the field. And I think uh, you know, as a quarterback, you have to be a leader, whether you want to or not. But I think the best quarterbacks are natural leaders because they, they are true to themselves and true to their teammates. And by example, um, you know, everybody understands that they love the game and that they want to win and that they, they're also, you know, they push their teammates to be the best that they can be, but they're forgiving of them too, that everybody's in this together. And so I think he has that kind of leadership style. Heart Sterling Journal. Hey, Coach. Appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, so, with the recruitment process, what's kind of changed over the years is that it seems like most of the recruits sign on early signing day, and official signing day is kind of the guys who hadn't made up their mind yet. So, when you get this new crop of last-minute additions, uh, aside from Dylan. Uh, what do you have to say about the other guys that you were able to haul into this class uh, in addition to Dylan? Yeah, I mean, I think both on offense and defense and, and special teams, we brought in all kinds of players that are going to help us. Some will help us right away. Others uh, will have to get into our weight room with Coach Butler and put on a little muscle and, and develop. And, um, you know, you got to become 
a little stronger physically, mentally, and emotionally to play at the next level. But we've got guys like Jonah Morris who came in from Akron. I mean, he's a dude, 6'4", 215, uh, and a physical specimen. He can make plays. Dylan Thomas from TCU, Cassidy Woods from Washington State. We already had guys like, you know, Jaron Mitchell, who's extremely quick and fast, excellent college receiver, and Sam Flowers and Noah Soraya, among others. I hate mentioning names because um, you know, I'm going to forget somebody. They're going to get mad at me and remind me when I see them. Um, we also brought in some really good young players. Um, and we brought a lot of uh, young players in from the state of Colorado, which is always nice. I mean, we recruit Texas and California, Nevada and everywhere else. But, um, you know, James Betchart is coming in as a freshman and Wilson Clark and Corey Hannaford, three linemen right there, right out of our state that I think are coming in. They've been well coached in high school for some pretty good coaches and they're good size. Um, and I think those guys can, you know, get in a weight room and hopefully get up to speed pretty quickly and have a chance to contribute early. But you also need players like Lamarius Benson, who we got from Central Florida, who can step in and play right now. Um, you know, you need that good combination of experience and youth. You need your youth to develop your program. But if you want to win right now, you need guys that have some kind of game experience. And unfortunately, when I inherited the program, there were a lot of guys with injuries or needed surgeries or that were moving on. And then of course, with COVID that changes everything again, because now players, a lot of players moved on that might not have had we had a season. And so you constantly have to rebuild uh, your roster defensively. Uh, we got a lot of pretty talented players as well uh, that are coming in in 2021. We have uh, big boogie, <laughs> Shervain Carmina. He's a big dude. Uh, you'll have to see him. He's a big dude, but great attitude. He's going to help us bolster that D-line. Nick Lyon, uh, Jax Brown, Lucier Lutier, uh, Kayvon Lakes. I'm going to forget somebody, Jalen Bird, um, a whole bunch of guys that we have. Um, and it, we also have a couple walk-ons that I think have a chance uh, to compete for us. And I think that's that's a really positive sign that we have so many guys that want to walk on the team and play as well. Um, we signed a guy with some speed and uh, Micah Naninga, who I think uh, has a chance to, to get on the field early, maybe as a returner. But with all the young guys, um, like, like with the older guys, it, it's a meritocracy. So for me, I don't, I don't care. If you're a freshman and you're ready to play, you're going to play. Um, if you're a senior, and you're ready to play, you're, you're going to play. So um, we have a lot of new guys on our team. And I think this spring is going to be crucial in terms of us being able to evaluate our current roster um, going into the fall. And then with our young players, a lot of it's on them. You know, in this bizarre year of COVID, not a lot of players show up uh, early and they're going to have to work out in the spring and in the summer. And they're going to really have to be physically prepared and uh, in order to even have a chance to, to start right away. And then mentally, um, you know, despite some of our guys being really well coached, there's definitely an element of complexity when you get to the next level in college. So uh, depending on how quickly they can learn our system, um, you know, that'll kind of depend on how quickly they get on the field, but extremely excited with the potential, great potential. Final Denver Post. Hey, I had a quick two-part question about Dylan. Uh, when it comes to his eligibility, being a graduate transfer who opted out last year, do you know how many seasons he could play for your program? And also, just in conversations with Dylan, how does he characterize his time at Michigan, being a guy who really had to wait his turn, uh, being such a highly touted prospect? How, how did he kind of grow through that experience? Yeah, he has two years of eligibility, and so he can play for two years um, if he plays for that many years. Um, you know, who, who knows, he could absolutely crush it this year and, and not be with us the following year. But, um, but he, he absolutely loved his teammates. He really did. He's got lifelong friends. He's graduating from Michigan this spring and some of his best friends in the world um, go to Michigan. Some, most of them are football players, but many of them are not. He just met some really cool people at the University of Michigan. And, you know, he definitely appreciates the fact that he was offered a scholarship there and he appreciates uh, the games that he got to play in. Um, but for whatever reason, sometimes it doesn't work out. You know, he was a, a starter going into the season. He had a small injury and then the coaching staff made a different decision. And I think with so many of our players, um, that happens, right? You go to a school, you, you have the dream of playing for them. Uh, you put in all the time and effort, first one there, last one to leave, that whole thing. And then, you know, you go through three different coordinators. Some players um, that we have went through a different head coach 
and uh, all of a sudden you're running a different offense. The reasons you went there are no longer there. And the, co the staff goes in a different direction for whatever reason, right or wrong. And you're just faced with the decision to make, you know, hey, this hasn't played out the way I thought. Uh, what next? You know, and so that's what a lot of the players on our team, including Dylan, have gone through, you know, an experience like that where uh, a lot of the reasons they went there originally are no longer there. But he absolutely uh, loves some of his friends that he made at Michigan, and he will have those friends for a lifetime. And it was really important to him that he graduate from Michigan. That was really important to him. And so I'm very proud of him. He graduated in four years and he'll have that diploma to put on the wall, still has two years of football eligibility. He wants to find, uh, you know, he came to UNC to get on the field, to play, to be around a lot of other people that love football that are in a similar situation and also develop for the NFL. That's a dream and a goal of his. And so, you know, I'm committed to helping all of our players do exactly what Dylan wants to do. And the same thing goes for Comate Coffee. Same thing goes for Xander Gagnon. Same thing goes for RJ Pott. Same thing goes for True Wilson. And right on down the line, all the receivers that we brought in, they're in very similar situations. And so that's what we hope to provide, elite coaching, a chance to develop them, to play at the next level. But in the meantime, get on the field and have a lot of fun playing college football. Aiden, Greeley Tribune. Hey, Ed, long time no chat. <laughs> um, going back to what you were saying about, you know, trying to, um, you know, kind of cut the football and family time up. Um, in terms of recruiting, how hard was it or how did you balance um, being a dad and supporting your son as he was making this decision while also trying to be a coach over here on the side? Yeah, you're right. I think, you know, it's the same as any parent with any child. You try to be a parent first and you try to love them and encourage them and guide them and mentor them. But as your children get older, you realize that they have to take ownership of their decisions. So I've never forced any of my boys to do uh, anything uh, once they became adults and had to make important decisions, whether that's where, where to go to college coming out of high school, you know, that was their decision. And I, I tried to help make sure they knew all the right questions to ask and they knew the criteria to evaluate and they they did their research and their due diligence and they vetted their decision and then at the end of the day that was their decision um, and it didn't matter if I agreed with it or not I supported them in their decision and the same thing happened uh, this year uh, with Dylan you know he had an opportunity to play at a lot of different places and I encouraged them to meet with those coaches, to speak with them, to look at their rosters, to look at their school and to decide if that's where he wanted to go. And I really kind of stayed back in the beginning of that process because I knew that he could play for us if that's the decision that he wanted to make. But I wanted to make sure as a father first that he explored all of his options. And if he decided to go somewhere else, I was gonna be 100% behind that decision and I would have supported him. I would have cheered for that team. Um, but I'm, I got to admit, I'm extremely excited that he decided uh, to play at UNC. Brady, KFK. Hey, coach. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this today. Uh, can you take us more into those, those initial conversations? As you said, you, you let, you, you wanted Dylan to, to look at different, uh, different programs, get his, get his feel for that. But when did that, uh, when did those conversations kind of start to turn into, wow, this is a possibility we're going to be a, uh, we're going to be back together at uh, UNC. Right. Well, in the beginning, you know, Dylan had opted out and he, there was still like a chance he could stay at Michigan. I mean, that was still a possibility until he actually entered the portal. And so he got a late start. You know, a lot of players entered the portal in the fall or over the break. Um, he didn't enter the portal till a few weeks ago. And so there was really no discussion up till a few weeks ago because he still was kind of waiting to see if it was going to work out at Michigan. Um, but once he entered the portal, you know, coaches see that you're in the portal and then they can contact you. And a lot of schools reached out and contacted Dylan. You know, what's, what's funny, and many of you know this, is that coaches will contact your son and they don't contact the parents. So, I, you know, they're calling him directly or DMing him or reaching him however they decide to reach him without me even knowing about it. So in the beginning, I was kind of letting that whole thing take its course. Um, you know, knowing that if he ever decided to play at UNC, we would have a spot for him. But I didn't know um, if that's the direction he was going to go. There's obviously schools with bigger stadiums that play, you know, power five. And 
um, a lot of other options that he had. And so I do believe that we have uh, as much or more to offer him than any of those schools in terms of our coaching and the players that we have and his chance to be developed uh, and to have fun in college and to be developed at the next level. But in the beginning, I kind of stayed back and let the offers come in and let the coaches call them. And then I would ask them how those conversations went. And I pretty much stayed out of it. And then as uh, the weeks went by, you know, I asked him, you know, who he was thinking about and kind of talked through it with him and made sure again, just like coming out of high school, that he was asking all the right questions and that he was looking at their roster and looking at who they're bringing in. And, you know, as a quarterback, you're looking at the talent around you and you're looking at what conference you're in and the chance of that team having success. And, and you have to weigh all those different options. And as a quarterback, it's a little harder than other positions because usually one guy plays, right? So you're really dealing with a situation when you leave a school, you have two years of eligibility but you have to be pretty sure you're going to play right away. Um, not Dylan's not afraid of competing with anybody, so it's not an issue. But as a father, I'm like, hey, just make sure you f- you trust the coaches and you're going into a good situation and you're going you're going to be in an offense that fits your skill set. You're going to a school that you want to go to. Uh, you're around players that you want to be around and and that uh, you think it'll be a positive experience. And he he did have some good options. You know, I'll, I'll admit it, he had some pretty good options. But uh, I'm absolutely thrilled that he he on his own decided that this was the best option for him to play at UNC. And so now just like with all of our players as a coach, it's uh, it's our job as coaches to develop them and to put them in a position to have success. Sean, Denver Post. Sean, Denver hey, Post. Hey, Ed, I, I know this is a unique year in a lot of unique circumstances. Uh, you've got something like half the incoming class has had collegiate experience somewhere else. And Dylan gets a lot of that ink. I know. Is that something you see continuing of looking at transfers being a place where kids can go if they want to find a better opportunity, or is that just unique to the fact that everybody can go everywhere now and it's kind of bonkers because of the pandemic? Yeah, I think in a, you know, in a perfect world, Um, you know, you get all the the best players out of high school that want to go to your school and you develop them for four or five years. But I think that perfect world, uh, that ship has sailed probably for 90% of schools. You know, there's certain schools and you can guess who they are, who, who tap into the the best talent every year and try to develop those guys. But the way that the uh, NCA has structured um, the transfer uh, rules um, th- this year has been, oh my gosh, record numbers of players in the portal. In the long run, we'll be just fine, but it does uh, potentially have a negative consequence on FCS schools. Previously, uh, a player could go from FBS to FCS and not sit out. Once they vote, and they haven't voted yet, but we are anticipating that they will vote on a one-time transfer rule that will allow somebody to transfer one time regardless of grade. Previously, you had to be a grad student and previously you couldn't go FBS to FCS. So anyway, without getting too specific, you know, players can leave at any time regardless of their grade and go back and forth from FCS to FBS one time without sitting out. So because of that, there's been a lot of pin action, not just with our team, but with every team. And I think that that's that rule is probably going to be here to stay and for a long time. So ideally, you would love to get the best players possible um, and hold on to them for four or five years. But they can leave now whenever they want if, if they think there's greener grass somewhere else. And also, we can accept players um, that feel like there's greener grass at UNC. And so um, I think the players are used to that. It's a little... It's a little more uh, transient, but um, we've been blessed that it's been a positive for us in that the kid, the young men that have come through the portal have great experiences from other teams and love football and, uh, and players embrace, embrace each other pretty quickly. So, yeah, I think, I think that's probably just the way it is in college football. Now there's a little more freedom uh, to move from school to school. And so the onus is on me, right? The, I have to create a really positive experience for our players and develop them and create value for them, which I I look forward to that challenge. All right, we'll go two more here. We'll go Kyle with the post and then Hart with Sterling Journal to end it out. 
Hey, Ed, uh, you know, with Dylan's credentials coming into this program, going back to high school, it seems there's going to be a lot of at least external expectations um, that your team could be really good this year that could maybe compete for championships. Uh, it's a crazy year. Uh, who knows what the season will look like and what the future holds. But with what the roster that you have now, do you kind of embrace those expectations of, you know, having a, a Big Ten caliber quarterback on your roster and a, a guy who could win you a lot of games? Yeah. I mean, I think we didn't receive one vote <laughs> from our conference um, uh, to win a championship. I mean, we, we got voted last by every single coach in our conference. So, you know, I don't feel like um, anybody is counting on us to do anything. Um, but when I was hired here, I was hired because I was given a vote of confidence by our president and our athletic director who said they would invest in this program and they would help me create a winning culture. So, with every team that I've ever coached at every level, it's about winning a championship. And a lot of people laugh at me when I say that. They're not laughing as hard now, but uh, some people are still laughing when we talk about winning championships. And I, I emphasize to our players all the time, uh, set goals for yourself. I'm a big goal setter. Uh, and I say, if you're not setting them high enough um, and people aren't laughing at your goals, then you need to set them higher, right? And so the same, you know, same for me. Our goal as a football team is to win a big sky championship to go on to win a national championship. I think if that's not your goal, what are you doing? Um, so that's our goal. And every day we prepare uh, in the weight room, on the field, in practice, when watching film, we prepare to be the best that we can be to give ourselves a chance to win a championship. That's the goal. That'll always be the goal. A lot of people are laughing. I'm hoping they're not laughing at the end of the season. But yeah, we expect to win every game that we play. All right, Hart. Hey, Coach, I guess on that note, um, because obviously with COVID and everything and the season getting pushed back to the spring, you know, there was the announcement that uh, y'all won't be participating in the traditional FCS playoff format for the spring and instead focus on uh, just individual games uh, and hopes to prepare for a regular season, uh, knock on wood, in the fall. Um, can you just give us your thoughts on uh, that change that has been made and how, what are the benefits and the, you know, possible detractions to that decision? Yeah, in a perfect world, there'd be no global pandemic, there'd be no COVID and we would have played in the fall. That's what everyone was looking forward to. But things happen. What are you going to do? You know, once in a lifetime global pandemic hits, it cancels your fall season. And then we were planning on playing in the spring. Uh, we took a vote as coaches and as presidents and ADs in the fall about who would participate in spring. And then, you know, Sac, Sac State was out. And then when we took a revote, which, you know, I didn't know there was going to be a revote, but then we took a revote. And then uh, Portland State, it was out. And then both Montana schools, Montana and Montana State, dropped out. And we were still planning on playing because our guys want to play so badly. And we knew it was going to be a challenge. Uh, everybody at our school is strapped in terms of bandwidth for the training room, for the equipment room, for the facilities, but we were still going to do it. And then just, we were just very unfortunate that uh, COVID struck us right when we were supposed to start practicing. So we were shut down. We were not able to use our weight room. We were not able to practice. Our wrestling team got shut down recently. Our basketball team got shut down last week. And it, it, it was just a ridiculous hurdle to try to overcome. And we didn't feel like it was a, the, the safest environment that we could provide for our players and not just players, our staff. You know, we have guys working round the clock to try to test and keep players safe and reshuffle use of facilities. And it, it, it's really taxing on everybody. And it's, it's dangerous, right? Especially we have some older coaches in their 60s and uh, we had a lot of guys getting COVID. I mean, that's really what it came down to. So we were shut down, we couldn't practice, we couldn't uh, prepare, we couldn't lift um, on campus. And as you guys know, football is a pretty demanding sport, physically, mentally, emotionally. And if you're not given the facilities or the time to practice and guys are getting sick, and let, let's face it, we still don't 100% know what all the long-term effects of this illness are. So our, our goal was to put the players' health and well-being first. So we were all disappointed that we couldn't play, but their safety is more important than anything else. And that means safety from contracting the coronavirus, but also means safety in terms of being physically and mentally and emotionally prepared to play. And when you can't access your weight room or your fields 
and you can't prep, I mean, you can't prepare. You're also putting your players in danger if you take the field without practicing enough before competition. So unfortunately for us, um, we, we, we are not going to be playing. We're going to probably play a couple of um, inner squad, not inner squad, but scrimmages against some other teams, which we're attempting to put together. And, and also the, the threat of injury in the fall was another concern, um, you know, playing a whole season in the spring and then turning around and playing a whole season in the fall where you could play over 20 games in less than 10 months. That's, uh, you know, that's a lot of football. And so players that, you know, get hurt in the spring, um, it's a concern for spring ball, much less having a season, uh, they could miss the fall. And so we have a lot of players, it's their last season, they're not going to get to play again. I mean, I feel for our seniors. So we'll have, luckily, the NCAA is allowing us to bring those guys back and not count them towards our, our roster numbers, but um, th they still want to play. So it's really important that they get a season in. And if it's not going to happen in the spring, we want that to happen in the fall. So between now and then, uh, get them in shape, get them ready to go, and hopefully create a, a great experience. And who knows, maybe we'll get lucky and we'll have fans in the stand, which is something that probably wouldn't happen in the spring. All right, thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks, Coach, and everyone have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you.